Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. Coming soon, new rules for traveling Canadians returning home. Travelers would have to be fully vaccinated. Details on who will qualify and how it will work. Also tonight, grief in London, recalling the words of a nine-year-old boy. All he could say it's my family, my family, and he's crying, mommy, mommy. A hockey coach's tirade recorded by his teenage players. I left and I was bawling my eyes out. And Paul Hunter explores the latest U.S. invasion. They're not the Beatles, but... Is this music to your ears? Oh, I love this. Meet the cicadas. This is The National. After 15 months of restrictions, isolation and sacrifice, another careful step towards something like normal today. With Canada's vaccination drive firing on all cylinders, Ottawa has announced new plans to make travel easier. Now, all of these changes are only possible if we continue to protect each other. And we know how to do that after a year and a half. Get vaccinated when it's your turn. Starting next month, some returning Canadian travelers will get a boost, provided they're fully vaccinated and can prove it. That requirement of a two-week quarantine will be a thing of the past. David Cochran takes a look at what is changing and what is not. Quarantine hotels are expensive and unpopular. 14 days of isolation and inconvenience. Soon, some Canadians could skip both. Travelers would have to be fully vaccinated 14 days or more prior to their arrival. And they will still be required to have a negative pre-departure PCR test result and required to be tested on upon arrival. People will still have to quarantine at home until they get their test result. If negative, the isolation ends immediately. The target is early July, but the timelines will be driven by the disease rather than the date, based on case counts and vaccination rates. Our border measures will take into account these kind of benchmarks, such as the 75-20, um, uh, and where we're at with that. The exemption will apply to Canadian citizens and permanent residents who are fully vaccinated with a Health Canada-approved vaccine. So this would be uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Johnson & Johnson, um, Pfizer and Moderna. And uh, of course, we'll be assessing other vaccines as we move forward into other phases. So David, this is clearly, you know, it's a critical, but it's just one small step towards reopening, not the comprehensive plan some people are looking for. Yeah, the government's taken a pretty slow and cautious approach on this, largely, Adrian, because there's still a lot to figure out. Like, what constitutes proof of vaccination at the border? I mean, Ottawa and the provinces are working on vaccine passports, but that's not done yet. Then there's the vaccine story. It's good in Canada right now, especially on first doses, but only about 10% of Canadians are fully vaccinated. So there's still a long way to go on second doses to hit the key benchmarks that public health officials want to see. And so what about the provinces? How are they factoring into this? Yeah, there's a broad range of, of opinions at the provincial level in terms of how fast you move on the border. Some are keen on it, but then you've got like Ontario, it's running ads, it's writing letters, demanding tougher measures to deal with variants. So the consensus isn't there yet. There is an appetite for a clear step-by-step -step plan. Today, all they got was a baby step. All right, David Cochran in Ottawa. Thank you, David. Thank you. And some news tonight regarding Canada's Moderna vaccine supply. After weeks of delays, those doses will soon start pouring in. Moderna will deliver 7 million doses in June, with shipments commencing next week. So Moderna has struggled to make deliveries on time due apparently to production issues, but it says it's back on track. Between Moderna, Pfizer and AstraZeneca, Canada expects to receive almost 56 million vaccine doses by the end of July. This lottery uh, gives Manitobans a reason to move uh, faster, to roll up their sleeves. And that's Premier of Manitoba explaining the province will put $2 million up for grabs this summer as it works to convince more people to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Anyone 12 and older who gets a shot will be automatically entered to win. Those 17 and under are eligible for scholarship prizes of $25,000.
Nova Scotia is addressing vaccine concerns with information, including details about those rare cases when someone gets COVID-19 even after they've had their shots. The province has a simple strategy to remind people that vaccines are safe. It is putting the data out there for everyone to see. Kayla Hounsell explains. Nova Scotia says it is responding to demand. The public wants to know, are people getting COVID after they've been vaccinated? It actually is part of the story that shows how protective and effective these vaccines are. So once a week, the province is reporting breakthrough cases. When a person is COVID positive two weeks after receiving either one or two doses of vaccine. We expect that with any vaccine program. That's our starting point. Since the middle of March, nearly 95% of Nova Scotia's COVID cases have been in unvaccinated people. 4.8% were partially vaccinated and 0.6% were fully vaccinated. Only two fully vaccinated people were hospitalized. One died. And I think it helps uh, people realize why they need that second dose. Do you worry that there will be people who will see these cases, few as they are, and just feel scared? I think good, tra honest, transparent communication, uh, factually based, uh, helps helps people uh, reduce that uh, any concern, any fear and anxiety. This infectious disease specialist applauds this kind of transparency. So, so overall, I was very impressed by what the numbers already showed us. These vaccines are really working. She hopes Nova Scotia will eventually include how many breakthrough cases are caused by variants. As we go forward and more variants are going to be out there around the world, having this system in place will really help us look at how effective are two doses of this vaccine in our very own country. Strang says that will require research. He points out immunocompromised people are more susceptible to breakthrough cases. That is why we need everybody to be immunized. So as we get vaccinated, not just to protect ourselves, but to protect those around us. Alberta is sharing similar data on vaccine outcomes. McDonald wants the rest of the country to do it too. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Police in London, Ontario, continue to investigate the killing of four members of a Muslim family, but they haven't been shy about the motive. As Magda Gabrasalasa explains, the evidence of the suspect's anti-Muslim hatred was seemingly gathered in the course of his arrest. This mountain of flowers has come to symbolize a community's grief, but this woman keeps thinking about a more haunting image. I could see the boy lying on this side on the grass crying. Karen didn't want her last name shared. She says she and her husband came upon the horrible scene just after it happened. Yamna Afsal, Medea Salman, Talit Afsal, and Salman Afsal were killed that day. Nine-year-old Thayez survived. Nali could say it's my family, my family, and he's crying, mommy, 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 mommy. And that's hard to take, especially when you have a little six-year-old at home. Police say Nathaniel Veltman targeted the family with his truck and believe he was motivated by hate. The laying of a terrorism charge is certainly on our radar and it has been since day one. The police chief says the accused has no known ties to hate groups at this time, but that what happened during his arrest in this mall parking lot was crucial. It was a culmination of speaking with witnesses and uh, looking at uh, video and uh, we eventually arrested the accused. And uh, from that, we, we made the determination this was hate motivated. The chief says hate related incidents have been on the rise. An update on how many is expected soon. But members of the community say action can't wait. This is a responsibility of every single person. Including the highest elected officials, says this Muslim faith leader. If you see, if you hear, any form of hatred, any form of racism, any form of discrimination, you stop it. You call it out. For now, the accused has been charged with four counts of murder and one of attempted murder. He has another court appearance scheduled for tomorrow. Mark de Gebrasalasa, CBC News, London, Ontario. Now, very little is publicly known about the suspect. Facebook confirmed it removed his account shortly after the attack. But Ashley Burke explains experts and advocates were worried about online hate before this attack. And already opportunities for prompt action are slipping away. 
Police say the London attack was motivated by hate. Now the hunt is on to find out where that hatred came from. There is probably uh, an element of online uh, incitation to violence or, or access to things that we have to think about. Human rights advocate Amira al Gawabi spent more than a year examining online hate for a report. She says Canada's regulations are failing, and despite relentless calls for action, a government bill in the works has yet to be tabled. It's really unfortunate that the real work that would make substantial change in the lives of people, not only Canadian Muslims, but other racialized groups that are targeted online, that type of change has not yet happened, and that really is a shame for us as, as Canadians. She says there have already been two other deadly wake-up calls. In 2017, an attacker opened fire in a Quebec City mosque. An investigation revealed the gunman was radicalized online, consumed by far-right media. Two years later, a far-right extremist in New Zealand live-streamed his attacks on two mosques that killed 51 people. We cannot wait to take action. This is the moment to talk policy. This is the moment to do something. In that moment, Trudeau signed a global agreement to roll out robust legislation in Canada. But two years later, little progress has been made. I can't tell you how frustrating and maddening it is. There have to be fines that are imposed for, for hate material that, are, that will hit them literally right in the belly, that will make them want to change. Because without that, it's not going to happen. The Heritage Minister's office says it's committed to tabling a bill in a timely manner that forces online platforms to monitor and take down illegal content. But with Parliament breaking for the summer in two weeks and a potential election looming, there might just be days to do that. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. With the former residential schools dominating news in Canada, the government announced today it has reached a settlement with students who attended, but only during the day. This applies to thousands of people who weren't included in a previous settlement. Olivia Stefanovich looks at that and other lawsuits still in progress. They shared the same playgrounds, classrooms, and within these walls, even abuse. It was uh, dark days. But because they went home at night, day scholars were excluded from the 2006 residential school settlement. Now, 15 years later, their experience is being acknowledged. Personally, I'm glad we're at this point where the government is finally uh, hearing us. The settlement would provide $10,000 for each eligible day scholar and $50 million in a special fund to promote cultural reclamation for the survivors and their children. It's estimated as many as 20,000 day scholars could be compensated. It's my sincere hope that this will unlock a healing process. But Ottawa is still battling another part of this claim. One involving 105 First Nations. They're seeking reparations for loss of culture and language caused by residential schools. The federal government says there's no basis in law to seek damages for those claims and denies it has any legal liability. They're on the wrong side of Canadians and it is a real stain on what the, the promises of reconciliation. The government is also involved in litigation with another group of residential school survivors. It's just so unfair, like we've already been traumatized as children by our own government. Those who attended the former St. Anne's residential school are fighting for documents, records they believe detail suffering to reopen their compensation cases. Have we not been through enough? The government says it worries the St. Anne's case could undermine the residential school settlement. But Bennett says she's open to a meeting with complainants, which they proposed. That brings some hope of negotiation after a nearly 30-year battle. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. A Winnipeg MP wants the government to declare that the mistreatment of Indigenous children in residential schools amounted to genocide. The NDP's Leah Gazan says she'll introduce a motion to that effect on Thursday. But one of her colleagues has gone further, saying similar damage to children continues today. Children are still being separated from their communities. Foster care is the new residential school system. By far, Indigenous children make up the largest client group for foster care. Briar Stewart spoke with people who want to change that and asked what it will take. 
Troy Bird has spent most of his life in foster care, aging out at 21. I feel like I've lost a lot of foster kids, including myself, have lost that connection to their traditional side. He said his own experience wasn't bad, but what does disturb him, the overwhelming number of Indigenous children in care. It's sad when you look at all the Indigenous youth being taken away from families and being put into homes before, you know, the parents are given a chance to work to keep the children. In Canada, just over 7% of all children are Indigenous, but they make up more than 52% of kids in care. In Manitoba, the rate is even higher, about 90%. There's a huge uh, power differential between... Raji Mangit is with the BC the legal organization that has been researching the province's care system. It's sort of like apprehend now, ask questions later, and that kind of manifests itself in not maybe going as far as you could go in thinking about how to support and keep the family together. Last year, the federal government implemented new legislation that lets First Nations take over jurisdiction of providing care. Half a billion dollars over five years was promised, but some don't know how far that funding will go. When you divide that up between all the child welfare agencies in Canada and the overwhelming kind of need that is there, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how that would how much of that is going to trickle down. Now I'm a part of what they call the millennial scoop. It just hasn't stopped. Shane Oski, who spent years in care, says there needs to be more physical and financial support. Just housing subsidies, because BC housing is so overrun, and how is a person supposed to create stability for their child in order for them to feel permanency if they have to keep moving because of the cost of rent? With extra support, she says, families might be able to stay together in the first place. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. MPs are looking for information in the case of two former scientists at the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg. They were stripped of their security clearance months after some viruses were sent to a lab in Wuhan, China. And some experts have raised concerns about espionage. Karen Pauls has the latest. When it comes to questions about whether the two former federal scientists were spying for China... I'm not aware of what you mentioned. Today, a Chinese official deflected. China and Canada have some scientific cooperation, which is quite normal and should not be politicized. But it already is. We don't know why doctors Chu and Chang were fired. We don't know how a scientist from the People's Liberation Army gained access to the Winnipeg lab. In 2019, Jiango Chu, her biologist husband, Kiting Cheng, and her Chinese students were stripped of their security clearances and escorted from the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, just months after Chu sent a shipment of Ebola and Henipa viruses to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Will he acknowledge espionage was involved in the Winnipeg lab incident? The public health agency has agreed to give unredacted documents to the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, which has the highest security clearance. This work can't be done without teamwork. In 2018, Chu received a Governor General's Award for Innovation for her work on a treatment for Ebola. Some of that work was done with scientists affiliated with the Chinese military. This needs to be a wake-up call for Canada. It appears that, you know, what you might well call Chinese agents infiltrated um, uh, one of the highest prized national security elements when it comes to biosecurity. This security expert agrees. Because if there's information that's going from us to a hostile uh, foreign state, that is something that has significant ramifications. Despite regular visits to their two Winnipeg homes, Chu and Chang have never been reached for comment. The two scientists remain under RCMP investigation. Their whereabouts are unknown. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Calgary-based TC Energy says it is officially pulling the plug on the contentious Keystone XL pipeline expansion project. The nearly 2,000-kilometer pipeline was designed to send crude oil from Alberta to Nebraska. Construction was suspended earlier this year after U.S. President Joe Biden revoked the project's permit. TC Energy says a failure to reverse that decision ultimately ended the decade-long battle to get it built. Now, Canada's five largest oil companies say they've got a joint plan to get to net-zero greenhouse gases 
by 2050. But critics say any chance of that will require a switch to greener energy sources. Peter Armstrong has this look. Canada's biggest oil producers are already committed to a net zero target, but they say having a plan and executing it are very different things. Okay, but how do you do it? How do we get to net zero? Under today's plan, these companies will combine forces, money, and technology to reduce emissions in one of the most carbon-intensive jurisdictions in the world. We found out that by working together, we can do this faster. We can accelerate the results and drive down the cost. Consider carbon sequestration. Instead of each company building separate infrastructure, they can build one common pipeline to capture emissions and deposit them underground. But the plan comes with a catch. It's kind of like, OK, wait a minute. We're taking emissions, putting it ground. There's no revenue source associated with it. How do we get the certainty in working to make sure that this is going to make sense for our shareholders going forward and we can stay competitive? There's no specific dollar amount attached, but the oil companies hope that certainty will come from governments in Ottawa and Edmonton. Not surprisingly, environmental groups are skeptical. This is a big funding pitch to the federal government is saying basically we'll clean up our act if you give us the money. Greenpeace, global investors and even research from the International Energy Agency says achieving net zero means getting into renewable energy projects and getting out of pumping oil. If they can't imagine it, they're going to end up being the blockbuster video of the 21st century who didn't recognize the threat that Netflix was. But remember, oil sands projects remain enormously profitable, adding more than $100 billion to the Canadian economy last year. Getting this transition right was never going to be easy or simple. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. An Ontario hockey coach has been permanently suspended after his abusive tirade was caught on tape. I left and I was bawling my eyes out. Up next, a CBC News investigation finds he is still coaching. Plus, they're coming to life in a deafening chorus after years underground. And some Americans are making a meal of it. I think they're best when they're extra crispy. Coming up, Paul Hunter gets a taste of the buzz behind this little creature's big moment. And millions are watching their every move, trekking more than 500 kilometers across China. The elephants and the online sensation. We're back in two. We have allowed, as a province, the title holders to make decisions on their land. British Columbia is honoring a request from three First Nations to defer the logging of old growth trees in two areas of Vancouver Island. Harvesting will be halted for two years on roughly 2,000 hectares. That includes the Ferry Creek watershed, the site of months-long protests that have led to nearly 200 arrests. The Ontario government says it plans to invoke the Constitution's rarely used notwithstanding clause, saying it will introduce enabling legislation tomorrow. Just yesterday, an Ontario court struck down some proposed changes to the province's election rules, calling them unconstitutional. The government says it has to act to protect elections from big money influence. An Ontario girls hockey coach was suspended earlier this year for verbally abusing players. The suspension came after one player recorded and shared what he said. Now you're about to hear part of it. And Jonathan Gatehouse found that the coach is still on the ice. When Nada Duffett's hockey coach called the team meeting after a player dispute last December, she decided to record it. He was very unhinged. He seemed very angry. On the recording, Jenya Feldman, the owner and head coach of the Hockey Training Institute, a private sports academy near Barrie, Ontario, is heard berating a number of the teenage players. And you f are not even smart enough to do that. So me, as a hockey player, I'm saying you're f***ing riffraff. In the 33-minute recording, Feldman uses the F-word 156 times. I would have asked if she was a guy, I would have asked her to punch her face in. Do you understand? He picked out players, he demoralized them. One of those players spoke to CBC News. We're not identifying her because she's concerned about her hockey future. I left and I was bawling my eyes out. It made me feel really angry at the time. Or Winnipeg's, uh... After the meeting, Duffett sent the recording to her mother. 
I sat there for about 10 minutes afterwards. I, didn't, I couldn't even speak. I called Nada and I said, you are to pack your bags and you are coming home. The Ontario Women's Hockey Association permanently suspended Feldman with no chance of reinstatement for 15 years. Right, so you started as a but despite that ban, Feldman is still coaching. He moved the team down to Florida. Posts on social media show him on the ice. A lawyer for Feldman tells CBC News that the allegations are false, but wouldn't comment on the recording. The OWHA and Hockey Canada say they have no jurisdiction over private hockey programs on either side of the border. There's no mechanism to, to enforce any type of regulation of what he does in his own business. Leaving the parents and players who spoke out wondering how a lifetime suspension didn't even last a season. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, the recent Mideast violence that a lot of media coverage missed. An Arab walked here and he was beaten up. They said, you don't have to worry, you're Jewish, but any Arab we see here is dead. We look at the street violence in Israel that targeted Arabs, Jews, and peaceful coexistence itself. The struggle to rebuild in defiance of hate. That's after the break. Welcome back. When violence in Israel and Gaza began to escalate in early May, another kind of conflict began inside Israel. Angry mobs of Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs roamed the streets attacking people. The violence touched nearly every corner of the country, including areas commonly known as pockets of relatively peaceful coexistence. Stephen D'Souza met with some people who saw it firsthand. <laughs> This gas station in northern Israel is at a junction between Arab and Jewish towns, where daily life often goes on without incident, but where recent violence showed the delicate fabric of coexistence can tear apart in an instant. There were throwing stones at, at cars passing here. Last People month, chaos surrounded the old gas station Shoshi Stavi's family has run for generations and the new expansion they were getting set to open. On May 12th, an angry mob of Jewish men, some tied to an extremist group of soccer fans, took over the intersection, looking for Palestinian Arabs. I just saw a lot of people, a lot of flags, bats, noise, shouting, firecrackers, like a battle zone. It quickly turned ugly. An Arab walked here and he was beaten up. No, no, no. Really, they were trying to kill people. And all the while you're just hoping that your workers uh, are safe. hidden and safe. Yes, well, I knew they were hiding. Everything I saw was basically outside this window. Her son, Naman, texted his two Arab workers throughout the night as he stood watch. It was uh, naturally terrifying. Um, I was afraid uh, for for myself. Um, I was afraid for the business. Uh, I was afraid for the people that I know. The crowd was on their doorstep. From the darkness of their hiding spot, Deeb Jerban was in disbelief. We said to each other, what do they want from us? Both of us have worked here for over 15 years and everybody knows one another. Why us of all people? It was the end of Ramadan, but instead of celebrating with their family, Durban and Asmat Shab huddled in fear for five harrowing hours. I had high blood pressure, racing hard. I was scared. I went into shock. The experience uniting them in a way they never imagined. The beauty of this country has always been at odds with the ugly combination of hatred and ideology that lives here. 20% of the country's population is Arab. And those early nights of violence saw Arab mobs on the streets as well, like here in Akko, one of a handful of Israeli cities with a large Arab population. After the fire, they went from here to the other side and robbed everything. They but less than a week after hosting a dinner with community members of all faiths, Uri Yeremias's well-known fish restaurant was firebombed by an Arab mob. 
it's partly because I'm Jewish and partly because I'm representing the coexistence. Yeah. So uh, both of them together makes me an enemy of the of the radicals. Twenty guests and Arab staff, including his chef and sous chef, hid here until it was safe for them to escape. But despite what they went through, Yeremias decided he wouldn't be drawn into a never-ending spiral of retribution. I decided on the spot that I'm not going to be led by anger or uh, revenge. As he begins to rebuild his restaurant, he says restoring and repairing the delicate balance between Arabs and Jews will be a long and grueling task. One uh, radical with a match in his hand can uh, create a fire that a thousand brave fire brigade people cannot uh, extinguish. Back at the gas station, they hired a security guard and are reminded every day how difficult it will be to restore that delicate balance. As we speak, a man on a motorcycle pulls up. The man swears at us as he walks by. Seems a little off. That's my life. The situation now is when an Arab customer comes, I'm all relaxed, and when one of those guys come, I'm a little bit tensed. In the weeks since, they've watched as local media have ignored what happened here. A reminder, coexistence doesn't mean equality. Nationally, Israeli police have cracked down on people involved in the ethnic riots, but the vast majority of those arrested and charged are Palestinian Arabs. The anxiety of that night still haunts Naman, bringing home a cruel reality. They were carrying Israeli flags, and it really saddens me that my the symbol of my of my country has become um, something that uh, worries me. Yeah. They said you don't have to worry. You're Jewish, but any Arab we see here is dead. Especially for Jews with the history of the Holocaust, we should uh, know better. The last month has held up a mirror to Israeli society and all the cracks that come with it that can't be so easily fixed. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Jerusalem. Climate change is affecting Canadian lakes in some unprecedented ways. It really does damage the local food system that Indigenous peoples rely upon. Disturbing new research about how fast it's happening. Plus... Is this music to your ears? Oh, I love this. Next, cicadas are having a big moment in the U.S., and Americans are feeling the buzz. Welcome back. In the United States, billions of winged insects are taking flight, and not even the president can escape them. Watch out for the cicadas. I just got one. Got me. President Biden got off easy and departed for the U.K. shortly after, but the press plane scheduled to accompany him was delayed for hours. Those persistent and plentiful cicadas had invaded parts of the aircraft, forcing Delta Airlines to dispatch a whole new plane. The insects have emerged from the ground in more than a dozen states. It's a rare phenomenon that is bugging a lot of people. But as Paul Hunter shows us, there are those who embrace the arrival of the cicadas. From up in the treetops, they sing their song with their beady little red eyes, jet black shell, wings of gold, and a sex drive for the ages. They are, of course, cicadas. And throughout the eastern U.S. this springtime, they are everywhere, collectively known as Brood X. Emerging from underground once every 17 years, there are billions of them, maybe even a trillion. And man, are they noisy. Here we are, Paul. We're in this beautiful landscape. As you can hear, the cicadas are chorusing in the treetops. A little noisy? Very. Yeah. Entomologist well, right Mike Raup can't get enough of this stuff, underlining that for female cicadas, that deafening sound 
is the stuff of romance. The male cicada's mating call, 17 years in the making. The way you do this is to sing loud and to sing long. If she likes it, she's gonna flick her wings, do a little dance, and then they're gonna hook up. But for cicadas, time up here is short. After all those years underground, they're in a hurry to squirm their way out of their shell. Within hours, they change color and start climbing and climbing ever higher, looking for one thing, a partner. And before you know it, they're both just plain doing it. Anyhow, anywhere, any way, and right in front of everyone. The catch, within a few weeks, they'll all die. The next generation won't do it again until 2038. The lesson, enjoy it while you can. Is this music to your ears? Oh, I love this. How can you not love this? You can touch it. Likewise, say millions of Americans who've now fallen head over heels for these things. You lead the way. Outside Gaithersburg, Maryland, it's a big moment for the McMullen family. Ooh, there's lots over here. They've come all the way from Utah just to see these things. This one right here. This is Roger McMullen when he lived in Maryland 17 years ago, the last time these bugs came out. Can you, why, don't you, why don't you hold it on your arm? Can you hold it on your arm? Now, he wants his kids to have that same experience. So it's a cicada vacation with Dean and Aurora curious and fearless. Jump, jump, do they jump? Most of the time. Let's look at this one. This one is a female. Oh, little one. You wanna leave the female ones alone? As Roger sees it, cicadas represent billions of little bug-eyed lessons about the wonder of our world. He's uh, even written a children's book on them. They don't bite, they don't sting, and they're not poisonous. I'm just delicious. Can I take one? Nature is very resilient, and it's super cool. Being able to handle nature and, and see it and experience it and be in the sunshine is really important for kids. And just to be clear, these things are not just in Maryland. This cohort of cicadas is spread throughout some 15 U.S. states. It's the largest get-together of its kind on the planet. Being isolated, quarantined, and I felt like a total affinity with these bugs. <laughs> Karen Boyan lives up in Ohio. Laid off and housebound because of the pandemic, cicadas gave her an idea. She put pencil to paper and bet that Americans were ready for some cicada merch. Now she's in the t-shirt business, with her bug design selling as fast as she can make them. If the cicadas can be determined and persevere, you know, I could do it too. I could push through these obstacles, you know. It's like a renewal and a, like a fresh start. But as it turns out, there's one more way cicadas are changing the way Americans think of bugs. I think they're best when they're extra crispy. Virginia's Elise Harris, a fitness coach and TV chef, has been cooking up a cicada storm. So you're gonna add your cicadas to the olive oil? Her tip for first timers, before we saute, they're freeze dried, so they shrink. She pulls off the wings, chops off the heads, and tosses in shallots and spice. It doesn't look like we're cooking bugs either. Right, the more flavor you add, you know, the less it looks like a bug. I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll get you some cicada sushi if you want to. No, 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 this is uh, one step, oh, baby, okay. baby step. <laughs> Elise can make cicada tacos, <laughs> cicada pasta, but for us. So we're going to mash up our avocado. It's going to be avocado toast here. with cicada and topping. You got them perfect. They're nice and crispy. And wouldn't you know it, that cicada <laughs> topping smells <laughs> cicada-licious. I never thought I'd say this, but. My mouth is salivating. Yeah. <laughs> They're also super healthy, and they've become the I Dare You snack of the year. <laughs> You're so excited, you can't hide it. You know, they look like mushrooms almost. But how do they actually taste? Mm. Mm -mm. Wow. Oh, it's really tasty. Thank you. I've kind of mastered it. Mm -hmm. And so it is in the waning days of COVID, Americans have found a noisy, tasty distraction. And look, don't worry if you miss them. It'll take another 17 years, but they'll be back. Paul Hunter, CBC News, outside Washington. Tasty, Paul, really? New research is showing just how fast climate change is affecting Canadian lakes. It's just like, 
I, I can't even fish here because it's thick. Coming up, the ruin it's causing and how experts say we can still slow the effects down. I'm Jamie Poisson and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, why won't the head of the Catholic Church apologize for its role in running residential schools? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Turkey has embarked on a massive effort to vacuum up a thick, slimy substance known, unfortunately, as sea snot. The muck has been wreaking havoc along Turkey's coastline for months, and it is suffocating the marine life underneath. It is said to be caused by a mixture of untreated sewage and other forms of pollution, but scientists say warming waters have helped grow the phenomenon. Now, we often hear about the effects of climate change on oceans, but the impact on lakes is also severe. Now, an unprecedented new study says Canadian lakes are losing oxygen at an alarming rate. Bonnie Allen has the details. In southern Saskatchewan, this is one of eight lakes that University of Regina researchers test and sample every two weeks. So you can see the oxygen's going to drop as you go down. Testing that's been done for 28 years. Watching what happens to lakes over time. And the lakes are changing. Data from here and similar research in Ontario helped scientists analyze nearly 400 lakes in the northern hemisphere. Their findings, published in Nature Journal, show oxygen levels have fallen over four decades by about 5% at the surface and 19% in deep waters. So in the surface, you're losing oxygen because it's getting warmer, and in the bottom, you're losing oxygen both because it's getting warmer, but also because the lakes are getting greener through time. Greener because of an oversupply of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, often fueled by human sewage and farm fertilizer seeping into the lake. At its worst, it breeds toxic blooms of algae. In the Muskoka, Ontario region, volunteers are monitoring the algae. With climate change and the more hot, dry weather, lakes that never had a blue-green algae bloom in the past, they could experience them now. All right, there we go. Jason Mattity is a professional angler who captured this video of the potentially toxic blooms. It's just like... I, I can't even fish here because it's thick. And I certainly wouldn't eat the fish out of there, and a lot of the older people say that they wouldn't do that as well. On Papikasis First Nation, Michelle Brass teaches traditional ways of hunting and gathering food. Decreasing oxygen in the lakes means there's less oxygen for fish to breathe. It really does damage the local food system that Indigenous peoples rely upon. Experts say it's possible to remedy the problem, but only if we control land use around lakes and slow climate change. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Pasqua Lake, Saskatchewan. Next on The National, wild elephants wandering in China and the videos have millions of people watching. It's our moment. These elephants are the newest internet sensation. They have been wandering nearly 500 kilometers across China and are now accompanied by drones monitoring them around the clock and hundreds of police ensuring their safety. The drone footage has captured the attention of millions of people across the globe, many checking in daily to see where the elephants go next. And tonight, they are our moment. I think the story of the elephants is amazing. I'm, I'm mesmerized by it as well. This elephant left the natural habitat. Uh, one of the explanations was that, uh, you know, food uh, uh, reduction. Uh, there was a competition for food. And, and I love the pictures that I'm seeing of resting on their sli sides. The trip has been exhausting for these elephants, especially uh, for the young, you know, cows. That also says they feel safe. Animals don't lie down to sleep if they don't feel some degree of comfort and peace and safety. And I think the popularity, you know, globally is motivated by the fact that people yearn to be outside. They love seeing animals who are free. And it's real, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a documentary, not that documentaries aren't real, but this is, this is real time. You know, most people love elephants because they're, they're highly social, they're really smart, you know. These are uh, an iconic species that deserve our attention, our protection. So there is an overwhelming you know, sympathy 
for this elephant. I think that this um, Chinese elephant journey is fascinating and wonderful and important. I agree. Okay, so they are a protected species, and, and what's happening is even though they've caused like millions of dollars of damage, there are hundreds of police officers keeping an eye on them, bringing tons of food to try to guide them onto safe paths. Sometimes people stay in their homes just to make sure they are safe. That is The National for June the 9th. Good night.